just wait. There she is, right on key. How about that? <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Hey. How's it going? Good. How are y'all doing? Fantastic. I was just saying we're probably going to wait about 60 more seconds ish for any more to come in and then we'll kind of just get rocking and rolling. Sounds good. Hey, Emily. Hey, Sarah. And oh, Caleb, I don't see Renee on yet. So if we could wait until she's able to sign on. Absolutely. Of course. Thanks. It's good to see you. Good to see you. It, although over the screen is a little different, but still good to see you. <laughs> right. For sure. Thanks for taking the time to present today. Happy to join you guys. Thanks for making this work. Yeah. Oh, there's Renee. Oh, perfect. Hey, Renee. You're muted, Renee. <laughs> there we go. Hello. Hi. Hello, Renee. Hello. How's everyone doing? Oh. Absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting us. We're happy to do this. Absolutely, absolutely. So now that we are joined by both um, Emily as well as Renee, uh, we can go ahead and get things kick started off. So my name is Caleb Benegas. Um, I'm one of the chapter co-presidents of uh, GIS Beta Mu for this semester. Um, I'm also joined by uh, Charles Taylor, the other co-president. Charles, if you'd like to introduce yourself real briefly. How's it going, everybody? Um, I'm also a co-president of uh, Gamma Iota Sigma Beta Mu. Um, I study economics, and this is my last semester at UCD. Uh, and I'm very excited to host you guys. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charles. I appreciate you. So, as I've already told Emily and Renee, um, this extends to everybody else in attendance today. I just want to thank all of you guys for joining us today. Uh, we should have a, a great meeting in store for us. Uh, we've got Emily and Renee here to just kind of tell us a little bit about themselves, as well as um, the RIMS organization as a whole and kind of what it offers um, as far as professional development and opportunities. So Emily and Renee, uh, I will go ahead and open up the floor to you guys and you can take it away. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And Em, I don't have our our order of events here handy. Here you go, Renee. Um, ah, thank you. Yep. So I'm sharing my screen with everyone. Um, so if any if at any time that disappears, please let me know. I know sometimes Zoom does weird things. <laughs> so our agenda, we're going to talk about who we are, how we got into this field. Um, what we see is the benefits and opportunities of being in risk management, how you yourself can get into the risk management field, what is the Risk and Insurance Management Society, also known as RIMS, and Emily's going to talk to you very extensively about what a rising risk professional is. So I'll get started. A um, little about me, that's my family. Um, I'm a Montana native, grew up in Montana, went to school at the University of Montana, graduated from law school, didn't know what I was gonna do with myself, there were no law jobs, moved to Denver, and ended up at the city of Cheyenne as a risk manager. I'd done a little risk management and an internship at the state of Montana. I didn't really know much about it, I kinda learned it from the ground up. There were no schools that would teach you risk management, they had ARMs and CPCUs out there in the world, but um, that was a, uh, a trial by fire, learning by doing. And um, after the city went to the state of Wyoming, and then I went to a private company after I got married and moved down here called Archstone. And when Archstone was purchased, then I came back full circle to another city government, to the city of Aurora, where I'm still currently employed. And um, that's our picture from our family. My daughter, Sophia, she said to tell you she's amazing. Um, and then, you know, as far as the, you know, what I've done in my professional career other than just those positions, um, I joined RIMS in 2005 when I started at Archstone. Um, when I was in public entity, 
previously in Wyoming, RIMS was a very, um, it, it was a great organization, but I really was mostly involved in the Public Risk Managers Association, the Prima group, because that was more my wheelhouse. Um, when I joined RIMS in 2005, um, I, I kind of hung back in the crowd for a while, and then a friend of mine got me involved on the board of directors. Um, at the society level, one of the big things that I was involved in for a while was the uh, Rooms on the Hill. They call it something else now. I think it's the Legislative Summit. But essentially, we went to Washington, D.C. and lobbied Congress on issues that RIMS was interested in pursuing. Um, National flood insurance program comes up about every couple of years. The Congress cannot see fit to renew that program for longer than a year or two at a time. So that's a constant presence on our agenda for lobbying as is, um, you know, we, we went after the TRIA program, trying to keep that um, renewed. TRIA, if you don't know, is um, the Terrorism Reinsurance Act and it's, been renamed to TRIPRA, but I couldn't tell you what that means. Um, essentially, after 9-11, the insurance industry needed a backstop for um, paying claims because 9-11 hit every single line of coverage known to man. It hit the GL, the professional, the um, aviation market, the property market, the general liability market, the workers' comp market. Every single line of coverage was hit or affected by that event. So. Um, the insurance industry went to Congress, as did RIMS, and asked them to put in basically a backstop so that when losses reached a certain threshold, that everyone would be able to go to the federal government, have it declared a national terrorism attack, and that coverage would then flow from the insurance industry to the government um, after losses reached a certain level. So anyway, boring insurance stuff, but um, very necessary. So those are the types of things we worked on at the society level. Um, locally, I've been a member again since 05. I've served on the board of directors since 2010 and also on the legal legislative committee. Um, I served as secretary, vice president, and now as president until next year. And um, just put a couple of little fun facts in there, but um, the picture on the right is the last rooms on the hill. One of the last rooms on the hills I attended, and um, there's quite a quite a group that goes to that event. Interestingly, there's hardly anybody from west of the Mississippi that goes to that event. Um, it's mostly East Coast folks, and um, Rims has tried locally has tried to get someone to attend every year, but of course with the pandemic that kind of slowed everybody down. So anyway, um, I will let Emily kind of tell you a little bit about her and what she has going on in her world and how she got where she is. Thanks, Renee. So I'm a, a Colorado native, went to Smoky Hill High School. And then when I went to college, went to CU Boulder and majored in Japanese. And while I was doing that, I studied abroad and realized I did not want to teach children Japanese. And if I wanted to teach at the collegiate level, I'd have to get a PhD in Japanese. That didn't really seem like something I wanted to do. So I did some soul searching and then I decided I wanted to go to law school. Did that at EU. And while I was there, I thought I wanted to be a trial lawyer. So I focused on litigation and trial prep type classes and went into private practice for a couple of years, um, working in a couple of law firms that were very small helping clients, um, in some cases, sue insurance carriers for malpractice. So it's very interesting work, but I decided that trial work wasn't quite the right thing for me. I didn't have the temperament for it. And I uh, decided that I would join Merrick and Company, my current company. I would join their contracts and risk management department. I had heard about Merrick because I interned for Merrick when I was a student member of RIMS in 2011. And uh, my boss was hiring and he wanted someone who had a law degree for a position that didn't really need it. So I was curious and we got to talking, one thing led to another and I rejoined the Merrick family in late 2014. So I'm coming up on six years here. So my job is a hybrid between legal and risk management and I love it. I get to do something different every day. And while I was here though, I learned that 
Japanese was wonderful. I loved studying it, but it didn't really give me a business background. Law school didn't do that in any way, shape, or form either. So I got my MBA at night as part of my professional development plan here at Merrick. And since rejoining the Merrick family, um, I have been a full member or a, pro a professional member is what we call it of the society and of the Rocky Mountain chapter specifically since 2015. I was first invited to join the legislative committee with Renee. So along with monthly networking, that was how I started to get more involved with the chapter. And then over time that turned into being invited to apply for a position on the board of directors. I joined the board in 2018 and then last year was um, voluntold, Renee, thank you, <laughs> to become the chapter vice president. So what that means is that I'm responsible for planning our monthly content and programs. And so that keeps me pretty busy, but it's a lot of fun. I love getting to talk to different people, network with different people, hear about different areas that people are interested in. And it's actually led to some pretty cool stuff at the society level. So society level is national rims. Rocky Mountain chapter is Colorado and a couple of the, of the local areas. So in 2019, I was offered a chance to join the Rising Risk Professional Advisory Group. All of you as RMI students would be considered rising risk professionals. Generally, the definition is seven years or less of risk management experience and you're a rising risk professional. So we'll talk some about that today because that would be something that all of you are right now. And I think there's a lot of resources out there on the RIM site in particular that would be helpful to you. And then about a month ago, I was invited to join the annual conference planning committee. And what that is, is we have responsibility for selecting the programs for the entire annual conference where more than 10,000 risk professionals gather every year. So we're in the midst of reviewing those sessions right now. I've also had the chance to attend conferences, which is wonderful, both from a learning perspective and from a chance to network with other folks. A couple of fun facts about me. I play the Kodo. I started learning that when I lived in Japan. It's the National Instrument of Japan. It's about six feet long, made of wood, has 13 strings. There's a little picture of it up here. And then um, starting about last year, I realized I actually enjoy running. And I just completed my second half marathon on Sunday. That's me in a nutshell. Renee, back to you. Oops, sorry. So why risk management and insurance? That's the ultimate question. Um, you know, insurance is something everybody needs. Every company needs it. It's required by government, by lenders, banks. Um, and honestly, you need to have something to shore you up financially if an accident or disaster occurs. Um, you know, the history of insurance, of course, goes back to Lloyd's of London when they started insuring um, freight on cargo ships that were sailing to what was then the New World, which is now the United States and other parts unknown. And it began as an investment mechanism for wealthy people and turned into this incredible business that's still going today. Um, so a company like Merrick would need to use Lloyd of London's um, insurance mechanism for many of its risks. A city like the city of Aurora, maybe not so much, although if um, law enforcement keeps going the way it's going, I may have to go talk to Lloyd's myself. Um, they're hard to underwrite right now. Um, you know, this is an interesting field. There's many different aspects to insurance. Of course, you know, we do the property casualty professional liability insurance in our world. Um, many people work in the insurance field that do benefits and health insurance. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different opportunities. There's a bonding whole group of surety companies out there and different types of sureties for construction projects and you know when you come to the city of Aurora to um, do any sort of work in our right away you have to post a bond you have to provide insurance so it, it touches and concerns almost every aspect of business and of our society and you know one of the things and this is the interesting thing to me so when I was coming up, um, I was one of the youngest risk managers 
out there. And there weren't very many people that had law degrees in my world. And it was, it was quite interesting to hear some of the folks um, who mentored me kind of discuss how they ended up in risk management. All of, most all of us re- ended up here by mistake. It wasn't intended. It was not a career choice. It just kind of happened. But I will tell you, um, you know, I'm not ashamed of this. I'm 53 years old and many of my mentors are retiring. They're in their six, late 60s, early 70s. Um, there's going to be a big demand for people in the insurance industry at all aspects of the insurance industry. Um, you know, people like myself who've been doing this a very long time are becoming kind of the, the old hands at this. Um, we are going to need people to replace us when we get ready to retire. I probably have another 15 years to work. Not many people want to work past 68, 70, but um, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, not just in the insurance company arena. There will be um, third party administrators who take care of claims. They will need people. Obviously the insurance carriers will need people. The agencies will need people, brokers, um, public entities and private corporations will need risk managers. They'll need risk analysts. So this is a very big opportunity for people like yourselves who are coming through the ranks, getting your finance degrees, getting some education in insurance and risk management. It's a good opportunity for you to find a niche. And, you know, as Emily said, she does something new, new every day. I do as well. And I'd never regretted taking this profession as my choice after some years of wondering whether or not I should practice law. I do contracts every single day and it always changes and the risks are always changing. Cyber liability was not something that was considered in 1993 when I started this gig. So, um, you know, just keep an open mind. You just never know where you're going to end up. I mean, this, this was certainly, I was going to be a prosecutor. That was going to be my life's goal. And it didn't turn out that way, but I'm okay with it. But, you know, it, it's a good, it's a good group to be involved with. The insurance industry is, it's a very small community in many respects and an, also a community that has a lot of um, diversity. So that's my spiel on why this is such a great career. Thanks, Renee. And then this is just a little risk management framework. I know you guys are RMI students, and so you've probably seen something like this before. But it's really about how do you identify, and then once you've identified a risk, how do you measure and manage it? And there's a lot of different things you can do there. I think Renee has already hit that nail on the head. I don't want to belabor the point, but there's so much you can do in this little wheel here that is just interesting and wonderful. And so we'll... uh, I keep chatting about that with some differing career paths. And Renee, I think you uh, you must have read this PowerPoint before we started. You know, talking. I really didn't. <laughs> but she knows, um, you know, there's different career paths and there's insurance companies and it's not just in risk management. If you have a risk management background, you can be a great asset in a marketing department at an insurance company. You can be a, a broker or agent who sells insurance policies. And so there's truly the sky is the limit and an RMI um, emphasis is really just going to help you guys have a broader base to start from when you are looking at what do you want to do with your life and what direction do you want to go? I think you've already heard Renee and I started one direction, went a different direction, and then we went yet another direction. And I think we both had at least two pretty big career pivots. And so it, it can happen quickly where you just suddenly realize risk management is right for you. Um, And one thing I like to always talk about are the types of insurance that are out there, because it's not just companies. um, That's most of what you see over here. Property, casualty, marine cargo, aviation, workers, comp, cyber, professional. Those are the things Renee and I deal with every day. But you guys might also be asked, you know, you've probably already been asked, hey, you're in the risk management program. Is my house insurance enough? Do I need to look at that policy? And so just having some of these basic skills and understanding of what does that insurance policy look like can help you with your friends as well as with your work. 
But I think where we wanted to spend most of our time today was on what is the Risk and Insurance Management Society? What can it offer to you as students and what can you offer to it? So Renee, I'll hand it back over to you for a little introduction to RIMS. So oh, RIMS is an old organization. Um, it used to be mainly a US Canada organization. Now it's global, which is why we don't call ourselves national RIMS. We call ourselves the Risk Management Society. Um, we have chapters all over the world now, and it is a growing concern, particularly in the developing world, China, um, India, and I say developing world, those folks are obviously very tech savvy. Um, they're doing a lot of great things in their, um, in their countries to promote insurance and risk management. And um, interestingly, last time I was at a RIMS, conference in Boston, there was a gentleman there from Nigeria who was talking about risk management, and he had some really interesting insights and in how things work in his country. But the more diverse our membership, the more things are very similar between us. The risks are a lot alike. Um, many of us don't have political risks, although with the election coming up there, I was just on a call today with our emergency management group. We are preparing for a political risk just in case um, people start protesting one way or another. Um, so those are, those are things that are out there. Um, globally, our society has these strategic Goals, you know, sustainable, adaptable organizational structures, giving professionals what they need to involve, evolve with the environment, you know, obviously enhancing engagement with its members in the broader community and expanding our influence worldwide. I think we are doing a very good job of expanding it globally. I think locally, you know, there's always work to do as people come through the organization and then they retire. Um, you have to talk to a new generation of people who are interested in the organization and, and give them reasons why this is a, a great group to join. And I'll just give you one, um, one observation. So I was a member of the Public Risk Managers Association for, um, I guess now it's 18 years, 11 in Wyoming and then six and a half here, almost 19 years. Um, the educational seminars that we always put on at Prima were good. When I got into RIMS, I was very surprised at um, just the next the next level of presentations and information that was available. And I think it's because of the strategic partnership between um, private risk management organizations and um, public risk management organizations and just the diversity of uh, members and the experiences that you see. So having been both in private sector and public sector, I think um, RIMS has really been a good, a good fit for me intellectually and also professionally. Thanks, Renee. So as a student in the RMI program, how can you get involved with RIMS? There is a student membership. It allows you to attend monthly lunches and networking events, and that's usually for free, especially right now with COVID going on. We've moved <laughs> We've moved all of our events to be virtual, but usually we uh, get to go to Maggiano's and have a family style lunch. And so we don't know what that's gonna look like in 2021. But for now it's a virtual lunch and sometimes there's also virtual networking events. We just did a, a virtual happy hour. Was that, that was last Thursday, right Renee? Yeah. And that was a lot of fun just to sit around and I had a root beer, someone else had a beer, you know, people just hanging out, drinking whatever they wanted and sharing the risk management issues of the day. So there, we're creating opportunities for networking and we're still providing education to our members, even if it's on a virtual platform. So I encourage you to join as students. It's, um, I believe it's free for you to do so. And if not, it's only $50, which I think is $50 very well spent. And um, Christopher and I were chatting right before this started about the scholarship opportunity that's currently out there for you. Oh, and thank you, Sarah, for sharing that link for the RIM student membership. Uh, so for scholarships, the application is out and available. There are four $1,000 scholarships that the Rocky Mountain chapter has chosen to make to the RMI program. Applications are due by October 28th. That is next week. 
you can check out this website. I'll make sure to share this presentation and I'll just actually do this real quick. Just plunk this in the chat for you guys. Well, I would if my brain was working, but um, I'll see if I can do it. Huh? There we go. I got it. Okay. There's eligibility criteria there. And um, you guys, we encourage you to apply. We encourage you to attend meetings more importantly, because the scholarship, wow, what happened there? Anyway, the scholarship money is important, but more important in my mind is the professional development and networking opportunities you get by joining the chapter. I'm a young risk professional and I had the opportunity in January because Renee couldn't go to represent our chapter. I, I said, I will. And I had the opportunity to actually spend three days in a room with the RIMS Society board leadership. And so because of that, I got invited to join the annual conference planning committee. And so if you want to be involved, the opportunities are there and I would encourage you very much to join. You've already started doing that by joining GIS. And um, if you wanted to get involved at the local level, we do have chapter committees that are great professional development and networking. Renee and I are both on the legislative committee, but there's also the programming committee, which puts together monthly events. So if event planning is your thing, you are welcome there. Any of them that you would be interested to join, you know, reach out to Renee or I, we're happy to help find you a spot. So I wanted to also touch briefly on what is a rising risk professional. Those are classified as young risk professionals who are new to the field of risk management. And young here doesn't mean age. You can be 50 and still be a rising risk professional. It's all about how much experience do you have in the field of risk management. And generally speaking, that's seven years or less and you're a young risk professional. Once you're considered to be an RRP, there's a specialized website and um, access that you're given. RIMS provides RRPs with risk knowledge, which is basically a website with all sorts of um, white papers, presentations, past recordings, great information to help build your risk knowledge, along with the risk management magazine, monitor, and blogs. And then for you guys especially, I think you might like to hear this, there's access to job listings in the risk management field. If you join RIMS as a student member, you start seeing those posts. And, you, and honestly, especially within our chapter, if we know of a student member and you guys have been active and involved, we do try to help you find a job if we hear of one that's available and would fit you. We do try to pass those your way so that you can get that foot in the door. And another great thing as an RRP is you're eligible to receive mentoring from a more experienced member of the profession. There's a formal program, um, I'm doing it myself right now with two young students from another school, not, not CU, sorry guys, but um, they reached out to me and asked for that help. And so we've been meeting once a month or so and talking about things and how things are going. And so it's been a, a good experience for me and for them. I've been learning a lot about what life is like as a student coming out into this COVID world. And, and it's really been eye-opening. So it's a great experience on both ends. So we uh, wanted to leave you, before we open it up for any conversation, we wanted to leave you with a couple interesting risk management issues that Renee and I have experienced in the past couple years. Renee, do you want to have some fun with that? Well, um, I don't know if it's fun, but I was trying to think of something that wasn't, um, wasn't in the newspaper recently because some of the things that have happened at the city of Aurora obviously are not very... Um, very good topics of conversation if you're running the risk management program. But um, I will tell you, there was a couple of, um, couple of things I dealt with up in Wyoming, which were kind of interesting. When I was state risk manager, one of them, um, we had a, a employee that was driving to talk to some people about wildlife that had been kind of hanging around their place and they, they wanted some guidance on what to do about it. And so our, our game and fish person was driving his truck to this people's home and got to the end of their driveway and their dog ran out in front of them and um, our guy hit the dog. Well, these folks decided that even though their dog was not some purebred, you know, dog show quality type dog, he was very attached to the dog. So, you know, our person, of course, for, profusely apologized about hitting the dog but these folks were like oh we've got to save this dog's life and they 
they took this dog down to CSU and that dog was in the CSU vet clinic for probably 10 days and they ran up the bill. It was about $14,000. And then at the end of the day, the poor dog had to be put under. And when you're in public entity, people show up at your office. So one day these folks came into my office and they must have sat there for an hour, you know, just trying to pull my heartstrings about how I needed to pay them all of this money for their dog, which they had, you know, taken to this expensive vet clinic, which, you know, was anybody who's been around up in northern Colorado or up in Wyoming, you know that if you take your dog to CSU, they're going to do everything in their right mind to try and save that poor dog, but it may not be the best thing for the dog at the end of the day, and you may end up spending a whole bunch of money and not have your dog back. So I had to sit there and counsel these folks for about an hour about how, you know, I understood how sad they were. I understood their you know, this was a member of their family, but the law was the law. And, you know, I, I really couldn't give them $14,000 to pay their medical bills and they're out of pocket for staying in a hotel. And, you know, it's, it, these are just the crazy things that happen. And I don't know if it's just public entity because um, I didn't see many crazy claims at um, private sector, but you know, people just, they come in and they just want to tell you their life stories and you end up sometimes playing counselor and, you know, you have to commiserate with their sadness. And at the end of that whole conversation, you still have to say no, because at that juncture, the law was the law and I didn't owe them any more than what the value of that dog was. They made the decision to take it to the most expensive veterinarian clinic in a five state region and that was really not the state's responsibility. So that was kind of one of the strangest cases I had, it's obviously, because it still sticks with me after all these years. And, um, you know, you, you just, you get into these, these questions come up and you just, you really have to not only put on your thinking cap as far as what what is legal what is not what is fair what is equitable but also you know what how do you make this how do you make saying no not feel so awful to the person you're saying no to that's a great example renee of how crazy the world can be i've got a couple quick ones and then sarah was just messaging everyone about her crazy claims history at USAA. So I just messaged her to be ready to go once I'm done. Um, so just a couple of quick, quick examples from me. One is Merrick performs services on all seven continents. And yes, that does include Antarctica. And a couple of years ago, we had um, some guys who were on a boat going back from Antarctica to Chile because that's one of the best ways to get there. And um, this guy unfortunately was stepping down on um, a staircase on the boat and you're on a boat, the seas are rough. He slipped, he broke his ankle. And so we had to coordinate medevacking him off of a boat in the middle of the Antarctic area. I don't know what the ocean is called down there, I'm sorry. I'm not geographically inclined. But um, he elected to stay on the ship because it wasn't a terrible break. So he walked around for two days with a Pretty badly broken leg until we could get him to a port and then properly medevac him to a country where the medical treatment equated to the standards here in the U.S. So he had a, a pretty impressive story and he still likes to give us crap for how long it took us to get him off the boat. And, and then um, and that was an interesting one because as risk managers a lot of times you're the interface between your employees and the insurance company and so trying to help manage that is very interesting. But since we're sharing strange stories, um, you might wonder why there's a picture of a lion on this slide. The strangest story I've ever had is I had a project manager probably about a year ago now call me up and he asked me where he could go to get a workers comp related rabies vaccination. And my first question was, well, why do you need a rabies vaccination? And turns out he and a couple of colleagues were in South Africa on work, had a couple free hours in the afternoon and decided to go to a nature preserve where one of the activities was they let you play with the baby lions. And um, unfortunately, two people got bitten by those baby lions and <laughs> needed to get rabies vaccinations. 
And so you don't know what's going to happen in risk management until it happens. That was probably the strangest one I have ever heard, um, at least here at Merrick. And I'm sure there's going to be some more weird ones. But Sarah, I'd love to hear this crazy claim story that you said you have. Thanks so much for sharing yours. Brings me back to my adjusting days. Um, I was just, for those of you who didn't know, I was just a property claims adjuster at USAA and USAA does personal lines only. Um, property meaning homeowners policies or renters policies. Um, so dealing with personal property, but also the physical um, structure of your house. And by far the weirdest claim I ever had was someone called me up. They lived in a suburb of Chicago very heavily wooded neighborhood and they had a deer crash through the window of their house and continue to bleed out through their entire home and they were filing a claim for this the weirdest thing i ever saw i do not like blood so i actually had a manager review the photos to confirm the, con the contractor's estimate because i did not want to look at them um, and the other strange thing about it, coverage-wise, if you haven't taken a PNC class yet, um, with the policy, there's open perils coverage, which is usually what the structure is covered under. So, in other words, you're covered for everything except for what is explicitly excluded in the policy. So, the structure had damage coverage because there wasn't an exclusion for a deer bleeding out in your house. On the flip side, all of their personal belongings, like their furniture, electronics, those sorts of things, those are under a named perils part of the policy that's usually pretty standard with any homeowner's policies. So in other words, the type of damage has to be specifically listed in order for there to be coverage. And unfortunately, we couldn't cover any of the personal belongings because there is not a named peril for a deer bleeding out in your house. We even tried to get creative, like explosion or something, but there was no gunshot. So it was weird and unfortunately a coverage issue as well. <laughs> that's new one on me. Yeah. yeah. And I grew up in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's <was> very strange. <laughs> Well, thank you both so much for sharing about uh, RMIS. I think that was a great and informative presentation for everybody. And at this point, I would just like to open the floor to um, our members and officers just for a little bit of a Q&A with Renee and Emily. Um, if anybody has some questions, I actually have one that I would love to ask. Uh, I know this semester, at least, um, our Beta Mu chapter is really focused and adamant on professional development. Now, that being said, uh, could you kind of uh, tell a little bit about some professional development events that RMIS has held both this semester virtually as well as in the past uh, before COVID? Sure, Caleb, it's, it's a great question. Um, and Renee, you were vice president before I was. So if you wanna talk about historical, I can talk about post COVID stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, historically, um, so RIMS has had a risk management forum every fall for gosh ever since i've been a member probably 2005 or six and that was usually it used to be a full day of education we'd have a keynote speaker we'd have a theme so if it was you know um soft skills how to how to be diplomatic in your workplace how to um listen with emotional intelligence, things of that nature. Um, one year we had a person come in and gave us a, um, a one hour MBA for risk managers and basically talking about how to read financial statements. And the importance of reading financial statements in terms of risk management is, is when you read the financial statements of any organization, you find out what their priorities are. And then you also can uncover where the risks are. So. Um, we did some things of that nature. Um, we always try to have a variety of topics at our meetings. And in the past, we've done things like had an actuary come and talk to us in lay people's terms because actuaries don't normally communicate in lay people's terms. They have a language all their own. We've had attorneys come and talk about the marijuana laws, how that affects employment how that affects, um, you know, criminal side of the house with uh, 
impaired driving. And so, um, you know, we've tried to really run the gamut. Um, cyber was a huge one the last couple of years when I was doing programming. We had several people come in and talk about cyber and artificial intelligence and blockchain, things that are up and coming that are really, um, they're getting a lot of traction now with COVID and companies are starting to see the value in pursuing those um, technologies. So, um, and then Emily's done some really interesting things this year and I'll let her speak to some of the uh, content that she's provided to the group. Sure, so let's see, our last in-person meeting would have been February and then the world went crazy. So for six months now, we've been putting on virtual meetings and we've tried to keep them as much as possible to the same type of topics we would have if we were meeting in person. So a lot of them have been webinar presentations and this month we're doing what we're calling our month of learning. There are two sessions left. I'll share that information with Sarah. If you guys wanna join, feel free to register and see what it's about. But, um, it, oh, thanks Sarah. But, thanks um, Sarah. <laughs> at least for this month, because we can't do that half day in-person education forum, we switch to one hour webinars each week. And so three of them are devoted to providing education, which helps you guys develop as young professionals because you're learning things you may not know. And then one of them was a happy hour last week and that was professional development as well because it gives you the opportunity to network and talk with folks. And for example, one of the risk managers on the phone last week or video, whatever way you look at it, was telling us about her difficulties with finding a new job. And so that kind of planted a tickler for some people and they were saying, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? So they were trying to help her come up with new ways to, to do the job hunt. And so there are both the, the formal education programs and then we're also working on trying to do more of the informal networking opportunities. And um, I think in November, we're looking at doing a cocktail making happy hour. I'm not sure on the date yet, but we'll make sure to get that invite out as well to you guys so you can start talking to some risk professionals and see what we all do. Awesome, thank you very much for your guys' answers. It sounds like you're really doing some, some cool and interesting things to still you know, uh, foster that professional development even though we are in a completely virtual format, unfortunately. But uh, does anybody else have any questions for Renee or Emily? Kind of open it up to you guys. Yeah, I got one. <clears throat> so I took Chinese for two semesters before COVID all happened, right? And I had this dream where I was like, I thought I was going to use my Chinese somehow um, <laughs> in my career, right? Like, I don't know, like, yeah, right? Like, that's as far as I thought about it. But what was really interesting from what I heard in a, a couple parts, from like slide 10, 11, and 13, was about like cargo marine um, types of insurance and other things. Like, you took Japanese. I was wondering if you know, like, is there really any way to like leverage that if I, you know, with, with my like limited Chinese, obviously, but like, uh, like is in, wouldn't that be useful in a cargo Marine? I would think it would be. Oh, fuck. Oh. You okay there, Caleb? <laughs> you okay, Caleb? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it could very well be useful. Um, I don't know how, how similar it is to Chinese, but in Japanese, Risk management is a different set of vocabulary. So if I wanted to practice risk management or review and negotiate contracts in Japanese, I have to learn new sets of words, new sets of sentence construction. So day to day Japanese, I'm fine. And that's actually really, oh, sorry, Kayla, we just slammed his knee on the table. But um, so day to day Japanese, I'm fine. And so that's actually come in handy a couple of times at work where we've had Japanese clients come in. So I had a lot of fun um, shopping for an appropriate gift to give them because gift giving is a really big thing in Japan. Yeah. So I helped kind of guide our project team on, you know, here's an appropriate type of gift to give because they will be bringing you something. And after the meeting, they were like, we didn't think they would bring a gift, but they did. Like, thank God we had this box of stuff ready to go. And so there's little things you can do, even if you're not reviewing a marine cargo policy that yeah. would provide that type of value. Um, took a, one Japanese speaking client to lunch and they didn't tell him I spoke Japanese in advance. So that was kind of fun. Oh, really? So I, just, cool. I just started going in Japanese and he's like, what? And so that, that was kind of a fun lunch because it really kind of blew his mind. You know, I don't look like the stereotypical Japanese speaker. And, yeah. and so that was a little bit of fun for me. I That's won't lie. Really cool. Yeah, I, I had a feeling you would have some experience with that because, you know, I mean, I, I, at least I know that it's, it's got some use still, you know, 
because I was, I, I mean, obviously, because still all the COVID stuff and whatever, the opportunities that would have been in China or whatever, I don't think are going to be a reality in the future anymore. So. Well, I will tell you that when you do go to China, cause I adopted a daughter from China, so um, I spent 17 days there. Everybody wants to talk English to you. I mean, it's little kids come up to you and start talking English because they need to practice. So um, if you know a few words of Chinese, it's great, but you could probably get ju by just fine. Um, I actually don't like um, 600 characters in Chinese. That's I amazing. Good. Yeah. So I think I can, I have conversational Chinese, but like a cargo Marine <laughs> is pushing <laughs> it. <laughs> if someone's going to make me read something intense, then yeah, there's no way I could. Well, the policy will probably be written by Lloyd's anyway, so it'd probably yeah. be written in English. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you very much. I've actually got another question for you guys. So um, on more of like a personal level, uh, how has your guys' day-to-day work tasks changed um, with kind of the bringing on of the COVID epidemic? Like how did you guys see your day-to-day -day work lives change in that aspect? Well, for, for us, first of all, my team wasn't set up for working remotely. And so the first two weeks of COVID was a big scramble to try and find laptops and to try and get them VPN access so they could access our database. And we had just started a data conversion to a new RMIS system and so risk management information system. So um, we were doing some big heavy lifts trying to just, you know, improve business and then COVID hit and it's like, oh my goodness. So once we got everybody with a laptop, we got their technology working and everything. I think the biggest change for us has been, um, you know, trying to keep track of who's where, who's home today, who's in. Our building was closed to the public, so we don't have anybody but our work group in our suite, which is nice. But, um, you know, they're trying to keep us at 50%. And so we're always trying to figure out how to do that. Trying to do Zoom meetings. Um, we, we 86 Zoom from our, our work group. They don't want us to use it after Zoom got hacked. So we're using Teams. And I'll tell you, I'd never really done a lot of hosting team meetings and things. So there was a learning curve for all of us. Um, we've actually started doing some training using Teams for our just general training for, for safety. And um, my, I, I also manage the safety team. So um, we've done some OSHA training online for some of our groups that have uh, certification requirements that they have to meet every year. It's, it's been a trip. I think um, doing city council meetings online has been interesting. When you have a public comment and they're typing up a storm on the chat and they're, um, you know, leaving voice messages with expletives and our people have to screen everything before the meetings. Um, the public comment period just, you can control it a little better when you're in person than you can when it's remote. So that's, that's been really interesting for us as well. I, you know, but now city governments run, we know we're still getting everything done that we need done. There's just more of it. Um, you know, we, everything we do, we have to plan ahead. And I, I'm sure that's kind of the way it is with you all trying to do your schoolwork as well. You have to plan ahead a lot of things. Um, you know, you start out in person and then you have to go back remote and that happened to my daughter's school. So I, I get it. I mean, it's, it's different, but I kind of like working from home a little bit. And we were kind of going there before with a lot of our younger team members that were coming on and really wanted more flexibility. And as, as a mom with a kid in soccer, whose soccer practice starts at 430, I got to tell you, I'm loving the whole idea of working from home the day soccer practice happens because I can still do everything and be there for my kid. So that, that's been great for me. Em? Merrick, we were lucky because um, my boss is our company's risk manager and he developed a crisis uh, response plan a few years back. And it happened to basically have everything we needed to do to deal with something like a pandemic. And so except for a couple, maybe two weeks at the beginning when we were trying to make sure everyone had what they needed to work remotely, it's basically been business as usual. 
we were pretty much set up to work from home to begin with. We've all started switching to laptops a couple years ago. There are still a couple notable holdouts. We have a 90 year old, I guess he's 91 now, who is semi-retired, but he still doesn't know how to use email. And so trying to figure out how he could keep working because he's just this fount of knowledge and you don't want to lose that. So things like that were really the exception, not the rule. Most of us picked things up pretty quickly and got working right away. I think the biggest change for me day to day has been that, um, you know, with Merrick, we have 19 offices in multiple states. We have an office in Mexico, we have an office in Canada, and we just opened an office in the UK. And so trying to keep track of changing COVID regulations across those offices has been really challenging. Denver City and County on Friday just issued a new order reducing the number of people who can be in meetings to five people. And so trying to stay on top of that stuff and advise senior leadership about it has, I think, really been the biggest change for me because it's, there's really an urgency to it. It's not something where it's, oh, it's okay if I get to that in a couple of days. So there's some things that really do push your normal work back and you have to jump into COVID stuff right now and do it. That's, I think, been the biggest change for me, just changing priorities a little bit. So as far as the claims that you guys are seeing now, is there, has there been a shift in the types of claims that come across with people spending more time at home? Are you seeing more like injuries with people trying to do home repairs or have you guys just seen any noticeable changes as far as the claims themselves in uh, COVID times? I think for us, um, you know, we've, we've had some actual first responders who were exposed to COVID. So we've had a few workers comp claims in that arena. And um, the state had legislation, they were trying to make COVID a presumptive illness. So if you were in certain activities, uh, a retail clerk or um, first responder that it was presumed you got COVID at work, which for us managing a workers comp system, that's, that's a pretty ugly thing. Fortunately, um, between the uh, self-insured association and some other uh, pinnacle assurance we we got that piece of legislation killed at the legislature we've been of the opinion that the best way to approach that is first of all all of our um, first responders have had covid testing and so we've um, allowed them to get tested for free um, we've worked with our insurer which is kaiser to try and make sure that they had follow-up care and our government had a situation um, where everybody, if you were exposed, you automatically got 14 days at home paid and um, you had to come back with a negative test. So we've been trying to accommodate that, but really the first responders, the building inspectors, those are the folks that are out facing the public every day. And they are the ones that we were most concerned about. Um, those of us who are in the big buildings, you know, we just, we closed them down so we don't see the public. We're more likely to get it at the grocery store than anywhere else. Um, as far as claims, you know, what's funny is um, people would have car accidents or they'd have damage to property from our guys plowing snow or they'd have hit a pothole in the road and they held on to those claims. And then all of a sudden when things started opening up, there was like a flood of all sorts of liability claims coming in the door um, against the city. So I, it was just all of a sudden, you know, we had a kind of a leveling off of the workload and then about May, early June, everything just started flooding in and we haven't stopped. I mean, we, you would think because the, the government building is closed that we wouldn't have much to do um, because we don't have drop in um, clients, but it's it's been nonstop since COVID. And I think the team is really just, we're all struggling because we'd like to take a vacation, but there's nowhere to go. Yeah, I, I hear you. And at Merrick, I think we're seeing something kind of similar that there's actually been fewer claims than there were this time last year. And um, part of that is we just don't have people out on the roads. So we don't have as much exposure on the auto side. We have fewer people in the offices so they are less likely to trip on a hazard. Um, what we're keeping an eye on though is we're hoping that you know we invited everyone you know bring your chair home bring your monitors home bring all your ergonomic stuff home so we're hoping that that will help keep workers comp claims from going up because when you're working from home if you don't have a good setup you might develop some sort of work-related injury so that's something we're really keeping a close eye on we're actually mm -hmm. i think on tuesday next week maybe doing a training at the company 
about stretches you can do working from home so that we can hopefully help keep that from becoming a big problem because I've, I can see that being a big issue as we keep working from home. Uh, Merrick, we've been, we've been allowing 50% back, but I'd say we probably have 30% who come to the building every day. And so most people are comfortable working from home, they're staying home and we wanna keep them healthy and safe. Yeah, prior to the, uh, the city building closing, like right when COVID hit, we, we told team members, look, here's, here's the criterion for working from home. Here's your ergonomics. This is how you should set up your workstations. Um, you know, you need to have all of these things in line. And if you don't, um, you know, let us know. We'll try to figure something out for you. And so far we're doing okay. I have not seen any repetitive motion claims yet from the work at home situation, but you know, that that's only a matter of time. And, and like I was telling somebody earlier today, you know, if, if you trip over your kids Legos because they're on the floor, because you know, that's life. Well, I'm not going to cover it for workers comp. Sorry. But if, it's a repetitive motion. We'll take a look at it. And I actually had an employee, um, my safety person that did an ergonomic evaluation remotely, which was kind of a fun thing for her to do. She said, it's, it's hard though, because you just, you can only see people from the head up. You can't see what kind of chair they're in, or, you know, unless they move their camera. And so it's a little bit of a stretch, but she, she could at least communicate with that person, you know, 90 degrees, you know, make sure your wrists are not arced, make sure your, your back straight, your feet are on the floor, that kind of stuff, so. I think it's really interesting to note that, um, you know, we've seen all these different industries kind of at least um, momentarily get shut down because of COVID, but that's just not the case for the insurance industry, is it? You know, it sounds like you guys just kind of trucked right through. Things did shift a little bit, but you know, the insurance industry kept going. And I think that really does tie back to that keynote that you guys made about, um, you know, the necessity of risk management and uh, insurance employees, you know, whether there is a pandemic or whatever's going on, we, that industry will still need professionals to fill those roles. So thank you very much for you guys' answers to my question. I really appreciate you. Um, did anybody else have a, a question for either of our ladies? I had a quick question. Yeah. So in terms of uh, underwriting, um, when somebody says or like a student and or a student is interested in that field um, and they say underwriting is a profession that uh, eventually will become automated, um, what is a good response for that? I think to a limited extent, underwriting can be automated. However, um, the risk analysis and risk evaluation that you undergo with a insurance renewal, and I'm, I'm in the middle of renewals right now, so um, if you looked at my stuff on paper, you'd go, oh my goodness, these people have a horrible track record. We do not want to insure them ever. You sit down and talk to me. You talk about, you know, what we're doing to mitigate our damages, what types of um, programs we're putting in place to to train people better, what we're doing in terms of law enforcement liability, which is my big one right now, how we're um, restructuring our department, the type of training we're doing, um, the diversity we're trying to work on in the organization. I think um, after you have those conversations with the underwriters, it gives them a little more perspective on what they're seeing on paper. I've done underwriting meetings primarily in the private sector, to be honest. Um, and, you know, the underwriters would ask you very pointed questions, you know, what kind of, what kind of um, fire protection do you have in your buildings? I worked for a real estate company. We owned multifamily um, apartment complexes. You know, what, what sort of um, mitigation do you have in terms of if you're in Florida, do you have hurricane shutters and hurricane approved glass on your um, complexes? How are you doing with the vegetation? Are you moving those big palm trees away from the property so they don't fall on them during high winds? Um, what are you doing in terms of the ADA? Are you making sure your buildings are compliant? You know, those are the things you kind of walk through with them. An underwriting, um, 
meeting is the most effective way to really understand somebody's risk. So yes, you can use the AI piece to kind of run through and compare a risk with similar types of risks. So if you're an apartment house in Florida, you can, you can take that risk and you can size it up against another apartment house in the same region and see what they're doing and look at the you know similar things and how they're rating one against the other to make sure you're consistent in your insurance um, premium ratings. But you can also go through that exercise and then find out the one company has just been lucky. The hurricanes missed their house or their apartment, but the other companies had three hurricanes come through and the damage hasn't been significant, but it's still on the books. So they look like they have a worse track record when in fact they've done a lot of mitigation so that every time the hurricane hits that region, they're not losing a lot of value to their property. It's usually minimal losses. So I think the intelligence piece is important to do uh, just some cross-referencing and some um, evaluations, but it, nothing can take the place of a face-to-face -face meeting. And I think when you talk to insurance professionals, particularly those of my generation, they're gonna tell you, hey, it's a personal business. It's people business. You have to meet face-to-face -face with your underwriters. They need to get to know you. They need to get to know how you operate, what your risks are. Are you a risk manager with 25 years experience or two years experience? Do you understand all the ins and outs of the underwriting process? Are you providing us with detailed loss information, detailed um, building COPE data? Are you providing accurate values for your properties? Have they been appraised recently? So those are the types of things that I think cannot be replaced by an AI analysis. That's my two cents worth, but that's just based on all my years of doing this. And Charles, the only thing I would add is it's not just Renee's generation. Insurance and underwriting is really a personal people-based business. It's really about the relationships you build with your underwriters. We try very hard to keep them for as long as possible. Because once the bit underwriter understands the risk that the company faces, it's easier for them to know what coverage is appropriate and what coverage that their company will provide. So there's, there's a, a very important relationship component there that AI just can't replace. And another thing I've noticed too, and Emily's probably noticed this as well, is underwriters will sometimes, oh yeah, we're, you know, we're gonna take your risk on, but then they have to go back to home office and home office says no, and home office has never met you. And they never got any sort of idea of how you manage your risks and who you were and what your company was about. And so that's, that's a frustrating thing from the client side of the house is trying to, to really penetrate that, um, that hierarchy in the carrier and to get them to understand as well what it is you are all about and what your risks are all about rather than just say, oh, well, they have cops, forget it. And that's what my carrier is doing to me right now. Oh, they got bought out. They don't want to insure cops, so they're going to dump the city. Well, great, but, you know, they didn't bother to talk to us about what we're doing to fix things. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword, you know. The AI piece, yeah, they can run all the numbers they want, but that doesn't mean, I mean, at the end of the day, the insurance company's job is to write business and generate premium. And if they keep avoiding risk because the AI tool says it's a bad idea, then they're not going to make any money. And if they don't make any money, they're going to go out of business. I uh, totally agree. It's just something I always thought about when somebody told me like, yeah, you know, underwriting is going away. And I'm like, I just don't really see any type of software or mathematics that can incorporate um, every type of, of risk there is. Well, that's, that I think you would find is the right answer to that question because I think that most people in the industry agree that it's a AI is an enhancement to what we do. It's not going to be substituting what we do. Well, this has been really fun, you guys. I appreciate all the questions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Do we have any more questions for our ladies, guys? No? All right, well, on that note, I would just like to extend one last thank you to both Renee and Emily. Guys, it's been an amazing hour spending with you guys. I think we've learned a lot about 
both Rocky Mountain RIMS as well as, you know, just um, general offerings of uh, risk management in the insurance industry. So one thing I wanted to highlight just with um, our chapter members, I'm going to go ahead and um, drop our Google Calendar link in the chat. Um, I want you guys all to just have that for reference and stay on top of that because we do have some really cool events uh, coming up. Uh, two of which, um, the first is going to be on the 23rd. We are going to uh, be participating in the RMI Virtual Shadow Day. It's got three sessions, um, one at eight, one at 12, and one at three. And each session will have just industry executives that you'll get to you know, talk with and kind of just listen to them present about um, their daily workings. And then a week later, on October 30th, we will be collaborating with Locked in Insurance uh, to hold a resume workshop. So I encourage all you guys to, you know, kind of dust your resumes off, kind of bolster them up a little bit and come prepared for that workshop with at least a rough draft of your resume so we can kind of get some good professional development work in. But that is all I have for you guys. And so I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for joining us today. All right. Sarah, did Thank you have you. something? Um, the link just was sent to me. Could you send it to everyone? For sure. Sorry for about sure. that. Yeah. With the uh, yeah. Zoom security updates, I can't copy paste. Thank you. <laughs> no problem, no problem. So there's that Google Calendar for all you guys. You can just open that and take a look at what we've got scheduled and then just keep popping back in to see new things that come up. So thank you everybody so much. It's been a great time. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you thank for you. inviting us.